Welcome to our Indie Street Chat. The members of Bloodhound Picks and an occasional guest give their no BS experiences with current aspects of the industry for people looking to break in or make their own production company. Thanks for gl- joining me, Glenn. And Yes, I am here. Yep. <laughs> okay. Um, so to start out, we just wanted to get to talk to you about like, how did you get into screenwriting as a working screenwriter and your involvement in the industry. So if you kind of wanted to talk about your your history. Sure, sure. Um, it's 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 long and it's weird. <laughs> um, the, the long is because I'm old, and the weird is because I'm me, I guess. Uh, but but when I got into it, um, I, I grew up. I was I was sort of a introverted kid who just loved books and movies and plays and paintings and stuff. So I sort of did all of that on my own, just as, you know, just in my room kind of thing. Um, and when I, whatever I would do, I learned actually how to make movies when I was in elementary school. Um, I had, um, I went to a hippie school and they taught us how to use Super 8 cameras. So I actually learned to make silent films, which was cool because I got the basic technology, uh, but I couldn't, we couldn't do sound. Um, but then after a while, I sort of gravitated towards theater because it was just easier to do. Yeah. Um, and then when I got out of college, I ended up looking at the things I wanted to do. I wanted to do theater. I wanted to write novels. I wanted to work on movies. And I chose screenwriting, actually, because it was the one likely to pay. Um, and I thought, well, if I do that one, then, then I can afford to do the other ones. Um, and that was, that was in the, the mid eighties. And there was a sort of boom beginning of spec screen play sales. And everyone was talking about, you can make a lot of money as a screenwriter. Um, and then I didn't get any money for 12 years. Um, so <laughs> I'm, I'm just stubborn. I, yeah. <laughs> um, I, was, I wrote, I got an agent with my first script and, um, and I was working in New York City, um, mostly as an office temp. Um, now and then I, I got a couple of jobs working for indie companies as their like script reader type person. Um, and all during the, for 12 years, I was writing scripts and getting rejected all over the place. Um, and then finally, the, the one I had written first, 12 years before, got picked up um, by by Tribeca, by De Niro's company, okay. um, to do uh, with Billy Crystal. Um, it was right before they did Analyze This, they, they thought they might do mine. And I could not, for the life of me, understand how to do a rewrite. They, they were asking me to make changes, and I was completely unprofessional. I had no idea how to make changes in something that I had made up. Um, so that all fell apart. But the money gave me enough money to write a new script, and that got picked up, and pretty soon I was a full-time professional Hollywood writer. Huh? Um, and that was 25 years ago. Oh, wow, that's great. Uh, um, <laughs> so that's it. That, that, I guess the thing is that, that that entire career path is non-existent now. Okay. I mean, at that time, there weren't a lot of... There weren't a, I mean, there were relatively less screenwriters and relatively less competition and, um, and the jobs were, there were a lot of jobs. There were, there was a lot of work for screenwriters in the eighties and nineties and early two thousands because the studios were developing a lot. They would, um, hire people to write scripts to see if they liked things. Um, and after the writers guild strike and the financial crisis in 2007 and eight, uh, the studio sort of got wise to what a stupid business plan that was because they were, they were spending a lot of money on scripts to find out if they liked projects. And they said, why don't we just decide if we like a project and then get scripts written to fit it? We can save, you know, 50 drafts. And, um, since then, that's how they work. And, and so all those people who used to do rewrites like I did, um, on projects where studios were like, maybe we like this, they, uh, all those jobs went away. Um, and so, um, I was going to say is what I've kind of heard around, I think when you, we met prior and you were talking about it is that people could, uh, basically make a whole living, a very nice living writing scripts without actually ever having something made. 
Oh, yes, absolutely. That was actually, when I came from New York to Los Angeles the first time, I met a, I was introduced to a bunch of people um, who were working in the industry, and they said, oh, you would do fine. You're a good writer. You, you, would, get, you would get a lot of jobs, as long as you don't mind that no one would ever make anything. Because if, if a studio is paying 50 screenwriters to write 50 scripts so that they can write, so they can make one movie, 49 of those scripts are never going to be seen by anyone. And and I was horrified. I was like, oh my God, I, that's the worst idea. I mean, artistically, that's the most frustrating thing you can imagine. Yeah. Um, but the, of course, they were paying the, the, a fortune. And so I, I gave up all those artistic scruples. I was like, yeah, sure, I'll write stuff that no one's going to read if you're going to pay me enough. Um, and that was an incredible experience. That was like just the, the most ridiculously fun day job you could ever have. And there was always that 50 to 1 chance that something would get made. It took me another 10 years, but I did finally get stuff made. Um, I just don't think, that usually doesn't have that much to do with the script. I mean, you have to have a good script, but then you also yeah. have to get lucky about every other layer. You have to get the right cast and the right financing has to come together and nobody has to have made a movie like it recently or they have to have made a big hit like it recently. There's just a lot of things that go into whether or not somebody's movie gets made beyond whether or not they wrote a good script. Yeah. Okay. And I know, so that's kind of something I wanted to talk to you about. And I know we spoke of prior as well is, uh, you know, film and television being a collaborative, collaborative effort. And I think a lot of screen people that want to go into screenwriting, they have this kind of belief that, you know, it is something, as you mentioned before, that they wrote and they hold on to it, you know, really tightly. So, you know, going into that rewriting process and how, what did you have to go through to start being able to just shed the, I guess, the attachment to... Well, I think I, partly for me, it wasn't attachment, it was terror. It was absolute <laughs> fear because I, it took me a long time. I love writing, but I, I was very afraid of failing, I guess, um, because I, I had a hard time. I, I got into a real state of just sort of deer in headlights, inability to write uh, around when I was in college. And, and it, was, it took me a long time to get past that. And the thing that got me past it was learning to, to live with my choices, to say, you know, it, it, making any choice is better than sitting here staring at the blank page and writing anything down is better than writing nothing down. And, and getting used to the concept that what came out of me was, was worth exploring, um, meant that it was very, that was the principle by which I chose. I would say, oh, this seems good to me. So if, if your whole writing process is based on this seems good to me, I guess I'll do it. And then somebody comes along and says, well, that doesn't seem good to me, but this other thing does. I baffled them. Like, I have no idea how to write that other thing because I only write what seems good to me. Um, so for me, it wasn't really, I, I mean, I was pretty hungry for, for work yeah. and for success. So I wasn't, so I wasn't like, you know, gosh, no, I, I, I think you guys are, are all fools. Although that there was a, an amount of that. <laughs> But, but a lot of it was just, I don't know how to do this. And it took me a long time to learn to uh, sort of have that exercise of somebody saying, write a scene like this and learning how to do it, or, or change the character to a radically different concept of your character. Um, and that, that's, I think, mostly a matter of practice and, and letting go of fear. Okay. If you have, uh, the part of me that was like, I really think this is good. I think you should let me do it my way. Um, I pretty quickly learned that the answer to that is just don't ask anyone else to pay for it. If you pay for it yourself, you can do absolutely anything you want. Um, but if somebody else is paying for it, they own it. I mean, that's actually the, the, the legal mm -hmm. situation. Um, unlike novels and plays and almost every other uh, narrative exercise, you don't own your material when you're a screenwriter. Um, the copyright actually goes to the person who buys it, and so therefore they can do whatever they want to it. Um, but even more than that, just especially with the cost of the you know anything except an ultra low budget movie, 
that's a lot of money. Yeah. And 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 the, when you get into the marketing, you're talking even even if you made a movie for a thousand dollars, it's going to cost them twelve million to market it if they go into theaters. <laughs> Um, not that, frankly, anyone's going to go into theaters anymore with a low budget <laughs> yeah. movie. Um, in fact, I'm not entirely sure anyone's going to go into theater works for anything except gigantic tent poles. Yeah. So, um, nonetheless, it, it, it's a lot of money and a lot of time, and somebody's investing in that for their own purposes, and they expect to have it be the way they want to. There are people, I mean, there are people with money, you know, companies and, and individuals who say, oh, I, I like this creative vision. I'm going to let them do what they want. That does happen. But most of the time, people want to tinker. Okay. Um, and the and the how-to is um, just it's a, a matter of practice and a matter of, of trusting your craft, trusting your ability to say, I know how to write a scene. I know what is. I know what the action of this scene is. I know what the character is trying to accomplish, and I can make that up. Um, it doesn't have to be just the way I do it, um, because it is actually. I mean, very, very few people make a movie all by themselves. Mm -hmm. Now and then, you can do it. Now, you know, you can actually take your phone and and make a movie all by yourself. But once you get into you know, if, if you have a separate mic and camera and lights, you're already, you need people. <laughs> yeah. um, so I guess the answer would be, if, if your argument against doing anything you don't want to do is artistic, then you should absolutely pursue that on, on your own dime. But if your argument is, I, I just can't do it, I don't know how to do it, then practice. Um, because I've had both of those experiences and the, my solution for the artistic feeling was I simply, when I, whenever I had enough money, I would make a little movie on my own and I would pay for it. And that way I, I could try the things that, that everyone said you couldn't do. And, you know, none of them were big commercial hits, but they were awfully satisfying. Mm -hmm. So my, my answer to that would be if you don't want to collaborate, do it. Make your own movie. You're going to be so glad you did. Um, and you'll also learn a lot. Oh, that's great. Um, I know you're, well, you've also directed several things as well. And yes. Is there, you know, what's the difference, I guess, between your, the writing and directing together and then, you know, just your writing for hire that? Actually, that's, that's a very important point. You just yeah. brought, brought it up that I hadn't realized when I was talking about yeah. this, I was assuming that, that someone who was like, no, I want you to do my script just my way was going to be the filmmaker as well, because frankly, if you're a screenwriter and just a screenwriter, you're just writing a script for other people to make, you can't just have everyone make things the way you imagine it. I mean, I suppose if you were really, really great at production and you understood how to write a script that wasn't going to need it to be tailored to the experience of, of making it, um, it's possible. But most of the time, everything needs to be reworked and rethought. The, the experience of shooting it, the, the realities of the location, the, diff the, the schedule, the actors, they all bring elements to it that you can't possibly foresee when you write it. So it's, it's literally impossible to write a script that people just shoot as they you know, as what as was written, I, I actually believe a lot of that mythology came during the studio system when they controlled everything. Mm -hmm. When they literally owned the actors and they built the sets and they put the light where they wanted, so that they, you didn't have to worry about. You know, if the door wasn't in the place that you wrote it, they would move the door. But that's that doesn't happen now. That doesn't happen in, in the real world. Um, so anyway, the the answer to the difference between writing and directing is is there massively different art forms and require massively different personality. Um, a writer works pretty much alone. I mean, you may be collaborating with one or two other people if you're writing with somebody or more. But a director's job is to actually organize other people to do creative things in a, a coherent fashion where everyone's going to work together and bring out their own creative abilities um, so that's your 
the director is is working with the form of other people. Other people are the instruments of a director, and a writer is just all by themselves working with words. So um, the answer is there's there's almost nothing in common <laughs> between them, <laughs> and I think a lot of writers think, oh, if everyone would just do the way I imagined it, it would be fine. Um, and I, I, it's not impossible, but most of the time, that's simply just not, not a practical way, you know, yes. way to look at the art. The fact is, when you write something, you're just, you're writing something for other people to make something creative out of. You're not actually writing the movie. You're writing the script, and then there's other steps, many other steps that have their own creative input. And they're, uh, you know, they're going to do it. If they want to do it well, they're going to mess up your work. <laughs> that's the that's the goal of being a screenwriter. So what you want to do is write something that is clearly, um, the, the intention is clear and the action is clear. The character is clear so that their interpretation of it Will still flow from your original. Oh, that's yeah, that's a really great way of putting all of it. Uh, so, I mean, you know, going back to what you were saying in the the connection, I know you, you know, I have watched Disfigured, which I mm, really yes. enjoyed, and thank you. What were, I guess, was that? Would you say one of your more I guess you're one of your proudest moments or <laughs> yes, absolutely. Yeah. yeah. And, and that's funny because it's, it was at, at least for a while listed on, um, I think it was IMDb's 10 least, uh, least well paid, like the 10 lowest <laughs> box office for, uh, in, in history. Um, oh. because I had only, I, I had it, we forewalled it. We took it, we rented a theater, we okay. paid a theater to show it for a week in New York City because that qualified us to get reviews. Okay. And especially then, it was about 12 years ago, It was you couldn't really get to make it seriously if you weren't reviewed. Um, so, as a result, you know, except for the, and we didn't advertise because I spent all my money on just renting the theater. So, except for the people I personally invited, no one came to it. So, I think we made like $512 or something on the one week run. And so, when uh, IMDb put together its lowest box office totals um, <laughs> in history. I w my movie was way up there, and yet, yeah, absolutely, it was one of the most satisfying things I've ever done. Is to to say I want to explore making an ultra low budget, very character based, very dialogue based, very personal, um, and I I. Did it the way I wanted, and it took much longer than I expected. <laughs> it was much harder, but it was one of the best things I've ever done, and it taught me more about writing than I think I would have ever learned just writing. Okay. Um, learning how to adapt your own work to reality is is a very very helpful skill. I would advise anyone who wants to write for the screen to at least try getting something made in some little DIY way so that you can have the experience of seeing what happens when your imagination comes up against the reality of everything that takes between the page and the audience. Mm -hmm. And I know you're, <clears throat> well, based on that, now, would you say, what would you be able to, or how would you be able to handle it differently now in today's kind of the the indus the current industry, which I know um you yourself you've mentioned how it's different than it was, you know, even twelve years ago, even ten years ago with streaming and you know, uh -huh. all the kind of binge content coming out. Like how yeah. would that have affected or I guess that the would process? affect my career or, or yeah. that project? Um just that project and then I guess moving forward, how has it affected and careers in general, like moving into the, this kind of modern age that we're into now. Yeah, I think, I mean, aside from the fact that cameras have gotten better, so I think we would have gotten a slightly cleaner image, because um, uh, that was shot on mini DV yeah. at the time. <laughs> um, but, but other than that, I think I would have made it almost identically. Um, and whether or not it would have gotten released more um, wider, 
in the streaming era, I don't know because the streaming companies have gotten very competitive and they need awfully big budgets and stars as well. So even if it had a place on, it was, it, I'm not sure that it would ever be more public, but I, I believe that, um, I mean, it's streamable now. You can, if you want to yeah. pay the three bucks, you can go to Amazon and watch it now. And I urge you to do that, by the way, audience out there. Um, but as far as what it did from what the difference is from, for me as a writer, as a professional, um, everything is different because for one thing, in, in the, the digital era, the streaming era, most of the projects and most of the work is in series, is in some form of episodic, uh, creation, which means that you're going to be working on a staff. Very, there's a handful of, of projects where you get one writer to write, you know, write the whole thing. But most of the time, you're talking about working on a staff. And if you're working on a staff, you're a writer supporting the head writer, supporting the showrunner. And your job is, is literally that, is a support writer. You're, you're there to bring your abilities to their vision, um, which is a, a, a really great skill to learn. Um, you can only learn it by working with people. You can only learn it by trying. And so the weird thing about that is you need to get really good at being yourself and then stop being yourself <laughs> and, and be what, what somebody else wants. Um, and that's what the new professional writer's experience is going to be. Um, once again, there will always be a, a, a class of, of really cool creative showrunners who say, I want to use the most out of my writers, and, and if they have a vision of their own, I want to incorporate it. But most of the time, they're going to be saying, we need you to, to work in a coherent voice, and that voice is mine. Um, so that's just a skill you need to practice, probably just by getting good at, at the ability to say, if somebody says, like, write a scene, or how would you tell this story? How, what's, how would you break this down into to episodes, and how would you break each episode down into scenes, and what would happen in them, and what would you invent that would come up for these people? And then you write a draft, and you have to write it pretty fast, and then they rewrite it, hopefully with you. Um, so that's the new job. Okay. I think now I would be great at it. <laughs> the times that I've done it, I've really enjoyed working on the staff. Uh, when I started out, I would have been terrible. I would have been just impossible because I would have been like, no, you're wrong. I, I think you should do it my way. <laughs> okay. So you're talking about though, uh, that, you know, the being yourself and then being so, and then, you know, kind of mm -hmm. crashing that. But so if you could actually kind of expand a little bit more on, I know it used to be, especially with television where it was, you know, it was the singular voice or there was a lot of time as, you know, when you're coming up and they're saying, oh, we want somebody that can make a, something like Quentin Tarantino or whatever director. Mm -hmm. Right, they, yes. And um, now with the market being so big, how, yeah, if you can expand a little yeah. bit more on that, like really creating your unique voice. To you. Well, that's, uh, I mean, that's sort of the, ta the, big, the big mystery task of, of all of creative work, isn't it? It's, it's to be able to say, I'm, I think it like, I, I think we all start out because we think of something. I mean, we already imagine it. Um, nobody's going to say, I want to be a writer if they never imagine stuff. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, actually, maybe, maybe some people are, but, but that would be for an external reason. Like, I want to be a person who writes, but I don't actually have stuff inside me to say. Mm -hmm. Uh, but almost uh, most people who want to be a writer, they are already writing in their head. They're already making up stories or, or creating characters in their head. So uh, the biggest first step is write that down. Write down whatever it is that comes into your head. Um, and that's always going to be a weird jumble of all the things you've liked and all the things that you've experienced. Because, you know, wherever you grow up and whatever language, uh, you know, and voice and style is your world, 
is going to influence it. And then everything you're absorbing by watching things is going to influence it. And that's where your stuff is going to come from. And it, it always gets sort of like jumbled up into this new thing. That's what every, I, I believe since the beginning of time, that's how stories have happened, is that somebody heard a story and they liked it. And then they said, ooh, I want to do that too. So that's the first step, is is want to do it too. Just think, oh, I, I like this. I want to do my version of this. Um, and whatever that is, do it. And, and then once you've done it, show it to people. Because until you show it to people, you can't tell what other people get from it. So when you, you're developing your voice, just imagine the thing you most want to see yourself. You know, you're your own best and most important audience. And then when you've really, really pleased yourself, show it to other people. And it, like, if you think it's really funny and everyone else is not laughing, um, then you got to figure out why. Because it could be just the wrong audience. And if you showed it to other people, they'd be like, oh, this is hysterical. Um, and then uh, the more that you try it out on people, the more you'll get a sense of what you want to do more of and less of and how you want to get your what's good about what you do better. Um, and read every one of those how-to books and articles and you know videos and all those things where they tell you all sorts of rules like oh you're you know this should happen on in this part of the story or your character always has to do this i i don't think any of those rules are actually true in the sense of like scientifically provable this is how a character works i think when you look at the vast scapes of literature you find that there's pretty much going to be an exception to every one of those rules, and it'll be a great exception. But every one of those rules has a little validity and is worth trying out. Try out the ones that work for you. So that's what I would say. To get your own voice, you start by looking at yourself. What do I want to see? And then you try and check every external tool that you can every um, trick in the book, really. Find out how other people do it and how other people say you should do it and use whatever makes it work for you, or whatever makes it better. Oh, yeah, that's great advice. Uh, <laughs> so I guess with that, though, then what would, I guess since you've kind of been in the industry for a while, what would you say is what you want to see or your specific style. Or, you know. Oh, I'm such a disaster about that <laughs> uh, because I like like so many yeah. different things. I am, I am just like a garbage can of art <laughs> <laughs> just, or like, I guess like a goat of art. I, like I eat from the garbage can. Yeah. I will, I just consume nearly everything with uh, zest. Yeah. Um, I really like, um, comedies, I really like thrillers, I really like horror, I really like sci-fi. I just, for me, actually, the, the thing I like most is when any one of those pulls parts from the others. Like, if there's if there's a really character-based comedy, um, you know, like, like, or if there's a, a really funny, you know, character-based drama, uh, whatever it is, if there's a thriller that has a weird element of horror in it, or if there's a horror movie that has a strange social comedy element to it, anything that's going to mix up the game and, and bring, I, I mean, ideally, if everything could get all pushed together in one thing, that would be my favorite thing. <laughs> it doesn't, it doesn't exist, but if there would be some kind of epic comedy, horror, thriller, sci-fi, social graces, analysis, I don't know, that would be my thing. So I, that's what, I'm always working towards that and never getting it. <laughs> <laughs> no, that sounds like something I'd want to watch. Yeah, I know. Yeah. <laughs> and so actually the, the, the new streaming era of, of you know, 68 hour stories at least gives me a better chance. Like a good, a good series tends to sprawl out. You know, away from its own genre and, and you get other things in it. And that's why I, I really, 
I really love that stuff. I love a good long story that that explores a lot of little crevices of humanity. Is there any that you would recommend? I guess right now that you know, fit that right aspect? now. Actually, I'm I'm really riveted by um, a show on HBO called My Brilliant Friend. It's this okay. Italian series, uh, apparently based on some novels about um, two women in Italy starting in the fifties and going uh, season two I'm only in the middle of it and they're in the 60s but I hear it goes to the 80s anyway it's just phenomenal it's it's just drama and social insight and it's gorgeous and it's beautifully every single character and there's a lot of them slowly but surely develops this this richness it's great stuff uh, but um, you know flip side of that I'm also loving Debs uh, which has one more episode to go on Hulu and is uh, just this abstract philosophical horror story that looks gorgeous and I am very curious to know where that goes uh, by Alex Garland who did uh, oh. Annihilation and 28 Days Later yeah. so yeah I'm all over the place <laughs> Bloodhound Picks Podcast is produced by Josh Lee, Craig Dram, and Kyle Hintz. Music by Raymond Seed. Audio editing by Kyle Hintz. <laughs> <laughs>